Welcome. You are listening to The Next Truth, where science and myth meet. A weekly podcast that explores mind-dazzling scientific research, theories, paradoxes, the connection between accepted and noetic science, and everything in between. I am your host, Maria Anna van Driel. This week's guest is an American social psychologist and the Cornelia H. Dudley Professor of Psychology at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois, where he founded the Environmental Studies Program and chaired the Psychology Department for a period of 10 years. Professor Frank T. McAndrew is specialized in the study of environmental psychology and nonverbal communication. In his mid-career, Frank moved into the study of evolutionary psychology, where he became best known for his pioneering work on gossip, creepiness, and the psychology of mass shootings. In recent years, he has become an essayist. Here it comes. Help me out here, Frank. Perfect purveyor. Yeah, supplier of psychological science to lay audience. <laughs> how, how does that sound? That does this, it, it that sounds okay. <laughs> okay. Well, English does contain some eerie and difficult words to pronounce. Yeah, your, your English is much better than my German. Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, yeah. Frank, Frank is an elected fellow of numerous professional, um, professional organizations, including the Association of Psychological Science, the Society of Experimental Social Psychology, and the Midwestern Psychological Association. He received his Bachelor of Science in Psychology from King's College in Pennsylvania and his PhD in Experimental Psychology from the University of Maine. His articles are published in dozens of well-known popular media outlets such as Time, CNN, Salem, and Scientific American. And he is a blogger for the online magazine Psychology Today. Frank, welcome to this week's podcast of the, From the Next Truth, where science and myth meet. Thank you. It's the best part of my day. I guarantee it. <laughs> Um, before you are going to creep us out with some in-depth stories uh, um, on the psychology of creepiness, I'd like to thank you for uh, donating some of your articles to both of the ne- magazines of The Next Truth, uh, uh, where science and myth meet and young people science. Yes, happy to do that. <laughs> both of us. Again? It's good for both of us. Yeah. One of your articles uh, uh, is can be read in the next truth uh, uh, where science and myth meet, and that is in from August 2019. And that was an article about why some people see ghosts and other presents. Um, let me search that for a second because I have it here. Um, in there, you uh, write, and, and I, 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 I read a, a little bit out loud from that, from your article. If you are walking down a dark city street and you hear a sound of something moving in the dark alley, you will respond with a heightened level of arousal and sharply focused attention and behave as if there is a willful agent present who is about to do you harm. Now, when we read a little bit further into that uh, uh, phrase, it sounds as if you mean that we are supposed to see ghostly apparitions for a form of survival. Well, I think we are supposed to see the worst possible thing in situations where we're not sure what's there. So we're the descendants of cowards. Um, oh. <laughs> that's, the way, that's the way to think about this. Uh, okay. Again, if I'm, if I'm walking through the forest 
and there is some bushes rustling. I don't know what that is. It may be nothing at all. It may just be a rabbit or something harmless, but it could be something dangerous. So I need to react as if it is a dangerous thing, a predator or an enemy waiting to get me. And if I'm wrong, I haven't lost anything. Um, But if I assume, oh, it's just a rabbit, I don't need to worry about that, and I'm wrong in that situation, then I pay a very steep price. So we're programmed to err on the side of being cautious. So uh, if you believe in ghosts or monsters of any sort. I do, I do. (laughs) And if you do, and if you believe that you're in a place where they might be found, then when you hear the creaking stair or the fluttering sound in the next room, just to be safe, you just know that it is a ghost. <laughs> okay. And you, and you behave accordingly. And if you run screaming out of the house and it turns out it was nothing, well, nothing bad has happened. So, but, so is it, yes. But yes, if you uh, assume that it's nothing and it is something, then you've got bigger trouble. So I'm not saying we're programmed to see ghost. We're programmed to see danger. And sometimes the danger we think is a ghost. Okay, okay so it, it's pretty normal uh, uh, when somebody scream a uh, uh, ghost or in a dark room. That is normal. If they believe in ghosts, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that is uh, um, probably then also the reason why we scream, because that is an, another article that you donated to the next group, but to the young people science. Um, uh, I've got it also here, and that article uh, bears the title Why We Love Blood Curdling Screams. That sounds very eerie uh, at first. Um, you say um, screams might simply, uh, might seem simply, but they can actually convoy a complex set of emotions. These, <clears throat> sorry, these, uh, of Human screams um, has been honed uh, over millions of years of evolution with subtle nuances in volume, timing, and uh, inflection that can signal different things. So, if I understand that correctly, um, when we find ourselves into a situation that we think that there is a danger, we scream, so we communicate with screaming. Yes, scream, a scream is a form of communication. And we have different kinds of screams. I, I might hear you scream with delight or surprise, in which case I will yes. come in to find out what exciting and fun thing is happening. But then okay. if I hear a very different scream, uh, I still might run toward you, but that would be to help you because I know there's danger and something bad is happening. And you can identify individuals by their screams So I can not only tell what you're screaming about, but I can tell who it is that's screaming, and that helps me decide what I ought to do. That that is that is a bit crazy that you can with only sounds you can communicate without well attaching words to that. Sure, and and uh, other animals do the same thing. Uh, primates have the same system of communication, so. It would be surprising if humans did not have this, given that other animals do as well. So we're not really different than an animal, except for the fact that we have understood that our language is uh, uh, words and that what is sound. So what is the creepiness about that? Um, I don't think that the scream itself is creepy, but the scream could be a tool that you use to warn other people about creepiness. Well, Uh, well, if if somebody screams from terror, that that terrifies me, that that electrifies me, that go, oh my God, there's something wrong. So yeah, I think that is terrifying when somebody screams like that, so. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, And that's why it's adaptive because 
what in effect you're doing, if I scream because I'm in mortal danger, what I'm doing is alerting my friends and relatives who may be nearby that they are in danger too. So it's a way of communicating to other people. You need to do something to save yourself. Okay. So what are your earliest memories for getting, um, of stepping into the world of psychology? Well, actually, I wasn't, um, when I started at the university, I was not interested in psychology at all because I didn't really know what it was. I thought it was about mental illness and crazy people and therapy. Like and many I, people think like that, yes. Yeah. And, and that is a part of psychology, but that's not what the whole field is. And it was not until I took a course in psychology where I found out all of the fascinating things that psychologists do for research that I thought, wow, th this is much more interesting than I thought. Uh, and so I got hooked there. So it was not until I was fairly old that I thought about psychology at all as something to pursue. So, so you say you got hooked onto a, a particular field uh, in psychology to research that is, like I, I shared before, um, gossip, creepiness, and mass shootings, among others. Yes. Uh, Why these creepy, eerie, scary things? What, what, what is the reason for you to, how did you get drawn to that? Well, uh, I wasn't really interested so much in ghosts and creepy things. I was interested in what this emotion that we use the word creepy to describe is. Um, I started noticing how frequently I heard people use the word. They would say, oh, that guy creeped me out, or this place gives me the creeps. Yes. And I started asking people, well, when you, when you say that, what, what do you mean? Do you mean you're afraid? Do you mean you're disgusted? And people were having trouble saying exactly what they meant by it, but they knew it wasn't the same thing as fear and disgust and some related things. Uh, what I did hear from women frequently too, was that when they talked about a person creeping them out, it usually had some kind of sexual connotation. They felt yes. threatened in some way like that. So I simply the same, got the, the, the same programming from from a, a previous time uh, when when humans, so uh, let's say, still were in Neanderthals, maybe something like that. Yeah, and uh, and women just have more risks to worry about in most cases than men do, so that that made sense. So anyway, uh, I was curious about this, and then I went to the scientific literature to see what experts had to say about it, and I was absolutely shocked. There had not even been one study on creepiness done anywhere ever by anyone. I, I couldn't believe it. Uh, so, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so I saw an opportunity to do something different and uh, did a study on this. And I've got some others uh, planned. I have some students working with me. So um, that's really how it got started, just out of curiosity about what this term means. Now, once I published a study on creepiness, the media started to call me around Halloween every year to ask, <laughs> to ask yep. me about haunted houses and ghosts. And I'm very comfortable talking about those things, but that's not the thing that drew me to the study of creepiness. But the curiosity, what it really is and why we feel that, that, that thrill of, well, almost excitement uh, in 2020. Yes, right. yes. Yeah, and um, we like to scare ourselves and creep ourselves out when we know it's safe. We go to horror movies or we oh, yeah. go to haunted houses and we know we're going to frighten ourselves and we pay money to do it. <laughs> also, yeah. willingly, also, willingly. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah, when, when you're talking about movies, uh, it was about two or three days ago, uh, I saw two movies, uh, and that was the first was uh, first one was Insomnia. Do you, have you ever watched that one? I, I, it sounds familiar. I may have, but what was the other one? There was The Collector. I don't know it's that. More, 
it's more a horror movie. Uh -huh. the, and, and the first one, Insomnia, uh, was uh, about, well, a, a, a sleep disorder that turned out to be possibly um, a, a, a kind of possession. And when I was uh, watching that, there were a couple of moments that I was going to afraid and <laughs> I had to turn down the volume and etc. So, and I had to think right uh, uh, about uh, our conversation that was already in the planning. And why did I watch that movie and why did I creep myself out? Except for the fact that it's safe to watch. Yeah. I think it's it's a very adaptive predisposition we have. Um, there are some things that are dangerous to us out there that we can't practice how to deal with. Uh, because it, if it happens once and you don't know what to do, you're dead and it's over. Yes. But we can learn through the experience of other people. So if you go to a movie where you're watching somebody being pursued by a serial killer, you can rehearse strategies. If this ever happened to me, what would I do? Now, I'm not saying you consciously turn on this movie and watch it so you can learn this, but your impulse to be interested, your impulse to be drawn in reflects this tendency to want to carefully watch what other people do and learn from their mistakes. If you're in a theater and you uh, hear the audience watching this movie, you'll even hear people gasping and saying, no, no, they, they yes. know that he's about to do something wrong. And so I think we put ourselves in this position uh, because it's a way of helping us learn things, but we're doing it in a way that we know is safe. And we enjoy it because it's the rewarding sensation we get that keeps us doing this thing that's good for us. So now you're a professor, means that you have students. Mm -hmm. And how do I um, think of you teaching your students creepiness? Do I have to think about uh, that students are in a classroom and then suddenly uh, it, uh, the lights go down and it's pitch black and you step in with a, a little flashlight dressed up in like a, a creepy, scary killer clown or... How do I have to think about that? Well, uh, first of all, I almost never teach about creepiness in my classes. It's something I research and write about. Uh, I do teach about emotion sometimes. And in those situations, I have videos that I will show that have those jump scares and things in them so students can feel the rush of adrenaline that comes from an emotion. But um, it's an interesting question. I hadn't thought about this until you asked me. <laughs> I, oh, poor students. <laughs> I, I don't really teach about creepiness much. Uh, okay. I, give, I give lectures that I'm invited to give in other places about this. But yeah, my students don't even know about it probably. Now I'm feeling terrible for the students that this idea is probably going to be practiced one day. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you take them also on field trips? I mean, uh, where, uh, for instance, uh, the Jack the Ripper uh, tour, for instance, in, in um, London? Um, I don't because, uh, first of all, we where we're located, there are not any good places to really go uh, for a, a tour like that. And the expense and the time is just something that, but it's an idea. I'll have to think about this. <laughs> okay. I'm bringing, I'm giving so much bad ideas for all those kids. <laughs> uh, uh, yes? They'll like it. <laughs> I, I, I hope so. <laughs> um, your research um, uh, on gossip, uh, for instance, um, how do I have to think about um, eerie things about gossip? Um, I got interested in this in the same way I got interested in creepiness, just by accident. I was standing in a long line in the grocery store, looking at all of the magazines about movie stars and wondering, who cares? Why do, why do people spend money to read about these people they're never going to meet? And that got me interested in the whole question of why we're fascinated about 
the lives of other people, especially other people that we don't know. Uh, so this is completely separate from my creepiness interests, but I, they're, they're tied together in that I am an evolutionary psychologist. So I believe that the way we think, the things that excite us, uh, the things we're drawn to are there because they've been adaptive and useful for our ancestors. So we've talked about why our ancestors did well to get creeped out at certain times. Well, if you weren't fascinated in what was going on with the lives of other people, you didn't do very well socially. You weren't oh. good at maintaining alliances. You didn't know who was powerful and who wasn't. You didn't know who was sleeping with whom. And so we're programmed to be fascinated by what's going on with other people. So just as we're descended from cowards, we're descended from busybodies as well. I don't know the term, uh, but yeah, we can't help it. It's part of who we are. It is not. A it, it seems that our species is not really uh, a positive at all. Uh, when I'm listening to you, or, or am I wrong here? I don't think there's anything wrong with it. it it's who we are, right? Uh, so you might as well just own it and be proud. It's, 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 it's for survival. It's all for survival. Yeah. And gossip isn't necessarily bad. You can be a good gossiper or a bad gossiper. Uh, you can. It's a social skill. What is the difference between those? A good gossiper and a uh, good gossipers are popular people. Oh, they, know, okay. they know things. Uh, people come to them for information, but people also trust them to be sensitive to the situation and to not share information inappropriately. Bad gossipers either just tell everybody everything they know, and so you don't trust them with information, or they have a very selfish agenda where they only use gossip in a negative way to damage the reputation of other people. Um, good gossipers often are concerned about the well-being of the group. If you and I worked together and we had a coworker who was stealing from the company and not, not doing his share of the work, if mm -hmm. I'm gossiping to you about this behavior, it's because I'm concerned about the well-being of our whole work group. It's not a selfish thing just for me. So yeah, they're, and, and gossip makes us be good, right? Uh, if you know other people are gonna gossip about you and that they're paying attention to your reputation, it forces you to be a good citizen. It forces you to do the things that you should be doing anyway. Yeah, people gossip about the next truth, please. <laughs> <laughs> what is it that you are trying to prove if you want to prove uh, uh, anything at all with your research, what, what is it that you want to prove? Well, I, I don't think my mission is to prove anything. My mission is to find out things that I'm just interested in. And um, perhaps by finding these things out, other people may find some use for it. Uh, for example, um, some of my research on gossip is being used to understand how people use social media like Facebook and Instagram. That's also gossip. It is. Social, it's gossip. It absolutely is. It's a, it's a great it's Some eerie posts uh, every now and then. <laughs> okay, yeah, fine. It, now, go on, go on. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I don't really have a mission. You know, like there's not a problem I'm trying to solve in the world. It's more, huh. I wonder why that happens. And that's really what guides my research. So that's the philosophy within your research. I, I would say so, yes. How do <laughs> things work? How do people work? That's what I want to know. What makes them tick? What makes them tick, exactly. <laughs> A free scary movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, in your, in your, uh, and I'm, I'm Trying to grab back uh, to your early uh, um, years, your, your teen years, that, that you have for young people, uh, did you have an influencer uh, to become a, a psychologist? Uh, and how do you become a psychologist? Uh, well, the answer to the first question is no, I did not. Uh, I did not know anybody who was a psychologist. I did not have a role model or a mentor that sort of guided me into it. I just sort of stumbled into it on my own. Um, but the way that, there are many different kinds of psychologists, but the way one becomes a psychologist is to uh, get your 
appropriate degrees, do the formal training at universities. But there are a couple of different paths you can take. You can be the psychologist who's the therapist. Uh, that's the one we usually think of. Um, yes. Or you can become a psychologist who's a researcher, which is what I chose to do. And then there are other applied careers. Uh, one can become a psychologist and work in the business world. There's something called industrial psychology or organizational psychology, where you're trying to make people more effective employees and make their work life more successful. So uh, one of the nice things about psychology is you can do almost anything you imagine. And if it involves people in any way, you can call it psychology. So it's very flexible. I read in uh, your Wikipedia page that you were a wrestler. I was a wrestler. Uh, in the middle of the last century when I had a very different body than I have now. Uh, but yes, that was that was something I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, why? Is it a really thing or is it, is it, uh, uh, was it a, a, a sort of connection um, for, for you becoming uh, a research psychologist or eventually? I, I think they're completely different things. When I was a boy, I liked sports a lot. I was fairly athletic, but I was very short and very thin. And so I wasn't big enough to be very competitive uh, in sports like American football and basketball where size is important. In wrestling, uh, they have weight classes. So you compete against people the same size as you. And so for me, it turned out to be a natural outlet for an interest in sports. I don't think it had anything to do with my interest in psychology. They, they're absolutely awesome. nothing. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I do want to want to ask. Yeah, I, I do want to ask um, that one thing because ghosts and, and, and eerie apparitions, 90% of the world population is interested in that. Um, did you have your own experiences? during uh, all your research? No, um, I'm a skeptic, so I don't really believe in those things. Uh, I am interested in the fact that so many other people do believe in them, and I'm interested in finding out what sorts of things uh, create the kinds of experiences that they have. Uh, but no, I have not had any experiences that sort of convinced me that these things are real. Now, that's what I'm talking about, supernatural things. Uh, have I been creeped out by people? Absolutely, yes. Uh, and so I find human beings to be scary, <laughs> not so much supernatural. Okay, that, 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 that you have to explain. Why are humans, human beings so scary, according well, to you? My, my chances of um, being harmed in some way by a human, I think are much greater than my chances of being harmed in some way by a ghost or a witch or a zombie. And uh, I've gotten into some trouble with this as well. Uh, you may or may not have noticed that I've written a little bit about the creepiness of clowns. And uh, I wasn't particularly interested in clowns, but when I did my research on creepiness, one of the things we had people do was to rank the um, creepiness of occupations, and clowns were rated as the most creepy occupations. And uh, I was invited by a magazine to write an article about why people would be creeped out by clowns. Anyway, um, this group of clowns got very angry and was holding me responsible for being the person who is telling people that clowns are creepy. And they oh. were leaving threatening voicemails on my uh, phone. They contacted the president and dean of my uh, college to try to get me fired, I guess. Holy macro. All, all of this was in an effort to prove to me that they're not creepy, uh, by the way. <laughs> well, I, I, did, I think they didn't do a good job there. <laughs> I don't think so either, no. And, so I'm, I'm still afraid this little tiny car is gonna pull up in front of my house someday. <laughs> All the clowns piling out. <laughs> With all those creepy balloons uh, swirling uh, in front of your uh, office window. Oh my exactly. God. <laughs> it could I'm a social psychologist, which means I'm interested in interactions between people. I'm not so much interested in what's going on 
inside of one person. I'm not so much interested in memory and learning and some of the other topics that psychologists study. I'm interested in how people deal with each other. So I am interested in topics like gossip. Uh, I've also done research on uh, what we call nonverbal communication. If I'm talking to you face to face, we're doing certain things with our eyes and with our gestures and how far apart we stand from each other. I'm interested in how those things, uh, how why they're an important part of the interaction between us. So anything that involves people in groups, why are some people more popular than others? Why do some people become leaders while others do not? Uh, that's the kind of thing I'm interested in. So uh, I'm interested in individuals, but I'm interested in how they're affected by other people. So in a broad way, that kind of captures my interest. So when you uh, watch um, uh, TV, for instance, when uh, President Trump uh, is on, that is your kind of thing to take his whole person apart. Well, sort of I, don't, I don't do abnormal psychology. So, uh, <laughs> okay, having, I'm having, sorry. <laughs> having said that, uh, I am interested in not so much what's going on with somebody like Trump, but I'm interested in why he is effective with some kinds of people and why some ways in which he makes arguments or tries to persuade people work and some don't. So I'm interested in how people react to somebody like Trump more than I'm interested in what makes somebody like Trump work or tick. Uh, now, there are other psychologists who are interested in that. So we kind of spread out the chores and we each study our own little piece and then hopefully it all comes together at some point. And uh, something completely different, but what is uh, on the minds of every, almost every single person on this globe is Corona. Mm -hmm. uh, you say you, you, you also um, research in, in uh, sociology. Um, what, what is your thought about uh, um, about why people are reacting and acting so intense on this uh, virus. It's, it's forcing us to live in a completely unnatural way. Uh, we're very, very social creatures by nature. And to suddenly deprive us of the opportunity to touch other people, be close to other people, be in large groups of other people, goes against everything that we want to naturally do. And that makes it very stressful. And there are a lot of other things about isolation that is stressful as well. Um, it's not that we've chosen to isolate ourselves. We ha it's something that happened to us. It's being forced on us. So we don't feel like we have any control over the situation. And um, one of the uh, main things that causes stress in your life is how much change is taking place. We like habits, we like routines because it allows us to do things without having to think too hard about it and expend a lot of energy figuring it out. When we're locked down, all of a sudden everything changes. We're not doing the same things we usually do. We're not in the same places. We're not uh, seeing the same people. So it's exhausting in a way because we're constantly trying to figure out the next step. We don't have a routine or habits to help us through that. So there are a lot of different things. So, so when you are in a lockdown like that, uh, what you explain now is that a certain kind of survival drift is taken away from us. And that's driving us, well, so to speak, nuts. Yes. Because in the beginning, you say, um, you know, when you walk into a dark alley and, uh, or in the forest and you expect uh, when the bush, uh, bushes is rustling that there is something creepy there and we need that to survival, but during a lockdown, it's gone. Right. And also, uh, getting back to the creepiness thing, I hadn't thought about it this way, but it is about uncertainty. You don't know if there's something to worry about in the alley or in the bushes. Mm. Well, with the coronavirus, we're locked down, but we don't know that we will get sick if we go out there. We might, but it's the uncertainty that drives us absolutely nuts, to use the same word that uh, you chose. 
there is no outcome. We like certainty. We like yes. to know. And this maddening idea that maybe I'm locked down and depriving of myself of all of this stuff for no good reason is very frustrating. But on the other hand, maybe there is a good reason. And if I go out there, I might die. So we're left sort of paralyzed and unhappy. We just don't know what to do. What is your favorite movie that you get creeped out over? It. No, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I saw it. I liked it, but I wouldn't say that was the creepiest. One of my, one of, when I was a child, the movie that I saw that creeped me out the most was The Haunting of Hill House. Uh, okay. It's called The Haunting. It's an old black and white movie about a group of people stranded in a haunted house. And when you think about the movie now, not a whole lot happened. Most of the movie was just people sitting around thinking something was about to happen. But I remember being just the right age to have it really scare me to death. Uh, and so I think that is, when I think of a scary movie, that's the one I think of first. Uh, but I, you know, The Exorcist and all the other standard scary movies. That could be what I try to take you apart uh, with a, a lay psychologist. That could be the beginning of the interest that you have for creepiness and research during, yeah, it, in that. It could be. Who knows? You're fantastic. right. So that's fantastic. So um, you have a personal website. I do, frankmcandrew.com. And what kind of information can we find there? Can we uh, can people also ask you questions via that website? Uh, they can leave email messages or, you know, I yes, they can send me a message through my website. Uh, they can't, like, speak with me through the website or anything like that. But you can download copies or get links to um, popular press articles that I've written as well as scientific articles. Um, you can get interviews uh, that I've done for TV or radio. Um, so there, I'm not hiding. I'm, I'm pretty easy to find out there. But if you were going to look for one place to find things, that would be the place to start my personal web page. And, and have you also um, uh, online lectures uh, because of the lockdowns uh, these days? Or how can people apply, if it's possible, to your lectures or? As a matter of fact, for the first time ever right now, I've been forced to teach online for the first time. So I am putting together a series of lectures uh, for my introduction to psychology class. So it's wow. for people just starting their studies who don't know anything about psychology and they're, but yes, they can be found They're on YouTube. So if you just type my name into YouTube, it'll pop up, I'm sure. That's uh, probably something for me because my uh, uh, knowledge in psychology is, well, not present. <laughs> well, you can also access them through my personal web page. There are links to the courses that I teach, including the online courses. And then there, there are links to the lectures. So. Oh, great. Fantastic. So everybody can watch what you have to say. Um, great. Um, but I guarantee they're not going to be that interesting to most people. <laughs> Why is that? Well, <laughs> it's, you know, a college lecture. And uh, they're PowerPoint slides with my narration, but you don't see me. So there's not the, you know. Interaction. Yeah, yeah. But, but yes, they're there. And if you want to look at them, by all means, help yourself. I can't even get my students to look at them. <laughs> and okay, there's no, that's not true. That is, I can't believe that. <laughs> Make them creepier. I, I'll try. Actually, I probably don't have to try. It just happens now. <laughs> um, before we close out, um, can you have? Do you have any uh, advice for young people who want to? explore the labyrinth of, of, of psychology and perhaps the, 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 the maze of, of the human mind? Uh, the one bit of advice that I frequently give to my own students, 
a lot of times, at least in America, students have come to the university and they think they have to have a job in mind and they see their education as preparing them to do that career. And that kind of takes the fun out of it, I think. What you want to do is come with things you're interested in and you will develop skills. And at the end of the time in school, you'll be able to get a job that you're interested in. Uh, so focus on what you're interested in rather than on what you think you want to do. And part of the problem when you're 18 years old is what do you know about what there is to do out there, right? That, you know, you don't even know what careers exist. So, yeah. Frank, thank you so much for being in uh, our show. And um, I learned a couple of things about creepiness and about psychology. And I hope that uh, um, many people will uh, 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 um, subscribe to your YouTube channel and watch the uh, videos and learn a little bit more. And again, thank you for being in our show today. Well, you're welcome. And I hope the next truth does well as well. Thank you so much. Thank you all for tuning in this week on The Next Truth with Science and Myth Meet. Make sure to visit our website, www.nexttruth.com. That is nexttruth, all in one word, dot com. And let us know what you think about our podcast. While you're at it, if you find value in this show, we would appreciate a rating on our website in the section, The Next Truth Podcasts. Or if you would simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us too. I am Maria Anna van Driel with The Next Truth. Be sure to tune in next week for our next episode.